Hey guys, this review lesson focuses on key concept one two. The struggle for sovereignty within and among European states resulted in varying degrees of political centralization. Essentially, the creation of the new monarchies and the increased centralized governments that were formed in Europe during the late 15th and 16th centuries. The new concept of the sovereign state and secular systems of law played a central role in the creation of new political institutions. In general, these new institutions were known as the new monarchies, and they coincided with the voyages of discovery and exploration, as well as the Renaissance and Reformation periods. Furthermore, methods included tax collection, tax collection utilization of war and increased military force, extend, expanding justice within their own domains and creating a more uniform legal system, as well as religious, the determination of religion within their realm. And the examples that we are going to focus on will be that of Henry VII of England, Louis the Spider of France, and Ferdinand of Isabella in Spain. We'll also discuss Charles V and the Holy Roman Empire, as well as Charles V's reign in, as a Spanish king during the early 16th century. In general, the new monarchs uh, it were able to increase because they relied so heavily upon advances in technology of warfare. Gunpowder under, underpinned the development of mobile military units, and rulers came to defend and conquer their expanding territories with infantry armed muskets. Dynastic marriages were also important, and larger, more powerful states were able to grow at the expense of the smaller ones. Although England had become more centralized back in 1066 when we and the Conqueror invaded, aristocratic intrigues really inhibited the creation of a truly strong central government, especially after the Hundred Years' War. Royal power had been undermined during that war, and Parliament often veered in its actions in accordance with the changing fortunes of the great lords who fought for control of the government. Returning soldiers who had been accustomed to pillage and lacking employment made the whole land insecure, and the situation actually worsened when war broke out between the two contending branches of the royal house, the Yorks and the Lancaster. This war, known as the War of the Roses, was fought from 1455 to 1485 and showed very ugly acts of brutality, murder, and betrayal. However, in 1485, the last York king, Richard III, was killed in the Battle of Bosworth Field, and Henry Tudor claimed the crown as Henry VII. He regained power and authority for the crown, peace returned to the land, and in order to legitimize his claim and his descendants' claim to the throne, he married Elizabeth of York. In general, Henry Tudor is known as a new monarch because of this increasing centralization and power of the English monarchy during his time as king. One of the things that he did in order to increase his own control of the crown was to introduce a new system of patronage, basically a new peerage. Those that supported him were rewarded with offices and spoils, and he relied upon them to suppress both popular and aristocratic rebellions. Those that had been opposed to him were often hung, and Henry Tudor seized their lands as well. And ultimately, this new system of patronage will increase loyalty towards the monarchy. Furthermore, we'll see it because of the stability in England, a new economic prosperity will begin. However, royal finances will remain a problem throughout the Tudor dynasty. In addition to this, Henry Tudor created the Court of the Star Chamber. And essentially, this court was simply a royal court, which often went against the principles expressed in English common law. Later on, the king's excessive use of the court of the Star Chamber will be one of the contributing factors that will lead to the English Civil War. Another country that became more centralized during this period was France, and their victory in the Hundred Years' War had led to the reestablishment of an effective government and the end of the feudal age in France. Yet the country itself somewhat remained divided until the rule of Louis XI, more popularly known as Louis the Spider. 
Louis was a cruel and cunning figure, yet he was a remarkable and capable ruler who had some good fortune in seeing his chief rival, the Duke of Burgundy, Charles the Bold, defeated and killed in battle. Louis is known for creating Europe's first national army, and with this national army, he was able to limit the power of the nobility by limiting their own, own armies. Furthermore, he expanded France. Uh, he was able to seize southern Burgundy, and you know, through marriage and inheritance, he had basically created a country that was stronger and with the administration confined in the hands of his appointees, an administration that grew and a France that grew as well. The system of royal postal roads also contributed to an effective communication system which further united France during this time period. Another example of the new monarchs would be that of Ferdinand and Isabella. Royal marriage of Ferdinand of Aragon and Isabella of Castile is what began the spark that unified the Spanish part of the Iberian Peninsula or modern day Spain. This marriage in one way inhibited the consolidation of a strong Spanish state early on, but it and allowed for the retention of local laws and privileges. Yet by 1492, and the successes of Ferdinand and Isabella, we're going to see a much stronger Spain emerge. They're going to strengthen Spain, Spain through several factors, one being that of the Reconquista. Keep in mind during the medieval period, Spain was probably the most tolerant, space, tolerant area as far as religion went. There was a mixture of Christians, Muslims, and Jews. However, many of the uh, Spanish areas had become Christian by the mid 1400s and the last strong Moorish stronghold was in southern Spain in the area known as Granada. Ferdinand and Isabella began the Reconquista, and its goal was to remove the last of the Moors or Spanish Muslims from Spain, and the last Muslim stronghold of Granada surrendered in 1492. After the surrender of Granada, the Ferdinand and Isabella were going to expel the Jewish population as well, and a minimum of about 165,000 Jews were expelled. Um, Another 50,000 or so were baptized, and many of the Jews fled to Turkey, North Africa, and a good portion of them actually fled into modern day Poland during this time period. In addition to this, we're going to see religious uniformity define Spain. To Ferdinand and Isabella, when we talk about the Reconquista and the expulsion of the Jews, part of that was very political. A strong Spain would be a Christian Spain or a Catholic Spain. And going back to, like I said, the earlier local laws, you know, by keeping one uniform religion, it was hoped that the monarchs would be able to rule. And so the Spanish Inquisition was enforced by the monarchy. Uh, it began in, established in 1478 in Sevilla, when some of the conversos or the con Jewish converts and Muslim converts to Christianity were basically not as sincere as it was hoped. And so it was oversaw by a Dominican monk named Tomas de Torquemada. And the, the main target really were the Jewish conversos, those that had converted to Christianity but were suspected of backsliding back to Judaism. Uh, other conversos from um, Muslim conversos were also targeted during that time period, as was anyone who really was defined as a heretic or went against basic church teachings. Um, and ultimately, we're going to see really by about 1500, the success of the Inquisition. Uh, Spain will be a solidly Catholic country and unlike France or Germany or any of the other areas of Europe, there are very few, very little, if any, Protestant activity in Spain during the Reformation period. And finally, one other way in which Ferdinand and Isabella were able to strengthen the Spanish state was through the New World Exploration. Uh, Columbus uh, sailed to the New World in 1492, and afterwards, by the uh, 1500s, we're going to see Spain claim and set up colonies in most of South America, Latin, uh, Central America, and parts of North America as well. These will bring great riches and gold and silver to Spain, and will the empire will actually be further developed after the death of Ferdinand and Isabella with their grandson, Charles V.
from his mother, Joanna of Castile, more popularly known as Joan the Mad or Juana la Loco, daughter of Ferdinand and Isabella, he inherited Spain, Spain's territories in the New World, as well as Spanish dominions in the southern Italian peninsula, Sicily, and Sardinia. From his father, Philip the Hansom, Hansom of the House of Habsburg, he inherited lands in Austria, southern Germany, and the Low Countries, including parts of modern-day Belgium's Netherlands and Luxembourg. Charles also believed it was his duty to maintain political and religious unity of Western Christendom. Thus, in Spain, Charles continued with policies such as the Spanish Inquisition and the religious uniformity that his grandparents had enforced. He did develop a permanent bureaucratic court in Spain to facilitate its governance, especially considering the fact that he was abs often absent for long periods of time. He was able to reduce provincial allegiances in Spain, and his reign really demonstrated the Spanish Golden Age, or Spain at its peak. In 1519, he was elected Holy Roman Emperor, and whereas he was very successful in keeping Spain Catholic, he was not very successful in stopping the spread of Protestantism in Northern Europe. International interests of the Habsburg Empire came before the need for reform of Germany, and he was often busy fighting the Ottoman Turks um, who were expanding during this time period. However, his chief rival was the House of Valois, or the French monarchy, led by Francis I. And the Habsburg-Valois Wars consisted of five struggles between 1521 and 1555. Much of the fighting occurred in both Italy and Germany, and essentially it resulted in the political fragmentation of the German states, as well as the continued political fragmentation of the Italian states. Protestantism proved a political disaster for Charles, and in 1555, he signed the Peace of Augsburg, which allowed the German states to choose their own religion. He also retired in 1556 and abdicated his lands, his German lands, to his brother and his Spanish dominions to his son, Philip II. Another event that we're skipping around a little bit here, but Part of the key concept in this particular area is the impact of the Peace of Westphalia. So just a little bit of quick background here. The Peace of Westphalia was the treaty that ended the Thirty Years' War and redrew the map of Europe. It also was a treaty in 1648 that was, in my opinion, a pretty major turning point in European history. First of all, it effectively ended the idea of medieval Christian unity. Um, we will get to the religious wars in the next unit, but by 1648, there were several Protestant religions and warfare, religion, religion as a cause of warfare, greatly declined. In addition, it accelerated the decline of the Holy Roman Empire. The war itself was the Holy Roman Emperor's last chance to reclaim authority and create an empire. However, by the end of the war, the Holy Roman Empire said that the Holy Roman Empire was neither holy nor Roman nor an empire, and the position of emperor was merely a prestigious position to hold with very little uh, power. In addition, we're going to see the rise of the Habsburgs in Austria and the rise of the Hohenzollerns in Prussia at the end of the Thirty Years' War. It will also allow for local control of religion. A uh, concept we will discuss later. Moreover, during this time period, we're also going to see several commercial and professional groups gaining power. Merchants and bankers, particularly in Italy during the early part of this period, and the German states in the latter part, will have some control over the politics and economics of their respective areas. In Florence, the Medici family uh, established the banking industry, and the wool industry made Florence a very wealthy area indeed, and the birthplace of the Renaissance. By the 16th century, the banking shifts to the northern part, and the Fugger family, based in Augsburg, Germany, will also dominate the uh, economics of that region, 
and will contribute to the spread of the Northern Renaissance as well as the economic prosperity uh, of the Northern States and the Hanseatic League. In addition, we're going to see the creation of the Noble of the Robes in France. These nobles were able to basically, let me rephrase that, these were people who were able to buy their way into the nobility and often held position as judges and on what were called the French parliaments during the time period and will continue to grow in power throughout the early modern European era. Similar will be the development of the gentry in England. England was different than the other European states in that inheritance laws were based on primogeniture, which meant that only the eldest son inherited the title of noble. As a result, English nobles often engaged in more merchant type activities, something that Spanish and French nobles, nobles felt was beneath them in order to take care of their children. And children who did not gain the title of nobles or sons who did not gain the title of nobles often became this upper middle class known as the gentry. And the continued development of the gentry will lead to the growth and power of the House of Commons in the English Parliament. In the English Parliament, uh, an issue or a factor that will actually lead to the English Civil War during the 17th century. Don't forget about secular political theories. Machiavelli as the prince was still the most important treatise of the time period regarding politics and power. And Jean Baudin wrote, was also a political theorist who favored strong centralized control during this time period. My favorite political po philosopher of the 16th century, however, was Thomas Hobbes. And his Leviathan essentially created a social contract between those that rule and those that are ruled. Rulers were often given an unlimited power, according to Hobbes, because those that were ruled were nasty, brutish people that needed a strong ruler to keep order. And so the common people would give up certain rights in order to gain this rule that would keep them in order and prevent anarchy during this time period. Furthermore, the competitive state system led to new patterns of diplomacy and new forms of warfare. The concept of balance of power began to supersede religion, and this is best evidenced by Elizabeth I of England. Although Elizabeth was seen as a Protestant, she wanted to keep Spain from getting too strong, and she aided the Dutch Protestants when they were revolting from the Spanish. She also sent her pirates against Spanish ships and pirates such as Sir Francis Drake were able to steal Spanish treasures from the New World. In 1588, Philip of Spain sent his armada to conquer England and to re-Catholicize England. And Elizabeth was able to successfully defend England against the Spanish armada as well, establishing this concept of balance of power that were really govern, govern English foreign affairs through the end of World War I and even into World War II. Another great example of the concept of balance of power will be Cardinal Richelieu of France. Richelieu ruled as regent for Louis XIII in the early 17th century. And the best piece of evidence regarding his role as a politique was when he went to war against the Catholics during the Thirty Years' War. As a result of the Thirty Years' War, France became the dominant power in Europe. And Richelieu believed that the politics, basically the Habsburgs, although they were Catholic, represented a greater threat than religious diversity. Advances in military technology also led to new forms of warfare. Called the military revolution, there was a greater reliance on infantry, portable firearms, mobile cannon, and more elaborate fortifications. Topics we discussed earlier, which helped the new monarchs to consolidate their countries. This also led to an increased need for permanent standing armies, and it was financed by heavier taxation and did require a larger bureaucracy. However, we'll see the benefits mainly in Habsburg, Spain, Tudor, England, the Fra in France, and Gustavus Adolphus of Sweden. A little side note about Gustavus Adolphus of Sweden, these new military techniques that the Swedes invent when fighting the Thirty Years' War will be used later on by the English uh, parliament 
and the English Civil War, and known as the New Model Army, will base it on these this new military, these new military techniques and this new way of fighting. The competition for power between monarchs and corporate groups produced different distributions of governmental authority in the European states. And one excellent example of this would be the English Civil War. Fought from 1642 through 1646, this conflict between the monarchy, parliament, and other elites over their roles in the political structure was caused by early Stuart abuses. The last Tudor monarch, Elizabeth, died childless, and her cousins, the Stuarts from Scotland, became the new English kings. And early on, the Stuart kings were unpopular. They often spent money frivolously. They made laws without the consent of parliament. They taxed without the consent of parliament and were generally seen as foreigners. And ultimately, their persecution of Puritans is going to lead to a revolt in the House of Commons. The Puritans, although a religious minority in Anglican England, had grown to be approximately 25% of the population. Much of the middle class had become Puritan. Thus, the House of Commons was dominated by many of the Puritans. The pro-Catholic policies of the Stuarts were seen as somewhat offensive. And ultimately, when the Stuart King Charles I requested money to fight wars, Parliament forced Stuart to sign, forced Charles to sign the Petition of Right, which essentially reiterated the ideas of the Magna Carta that limited the king's power, refused to allow the king to tax without the consent of Parliament, and kept the kings from imprisoning opponents without fair trial, something that had been established by the Court of the Star Chamber earlier. Although this seemed like an easy solution, the following year Charles just simply dismissed Parliament, ignored the Petition of Right, and ruled for 11 years without a parliament as an absolute monarch. In 1640, however, when the, Scots rebelled against, when the Scots rebelled against Charles, he needed money and he called parliament into session. Parliament would not even deal with Charles's requests until they addressed, he addressed his abuses. Thus, he dismissed them, and this was known as the short parliament. However, this didn't solve Charles's financial problems and he reconvened Parliament again a few weeks later, and this new Parliament, known as the Long Parliament, would last in some form or another for over the next 10 years. In 1642, Charles tried to arrest leading members of the House of Commons who were opposed to his policies, and this arrest, or well, the arrest didn't happen. They, they weren't there. However, this was the spark for the English Civil War. And from 1642 through 1646, the Roundheads, led by Puritan members of Parliament and Oliver Cromwell, fought against the Cavaliers, those that were loyal to the king. The Roundheads tended to be Puritan gentry uh, who were often wealthy, whereas the Cavaliers were the, supported by the wealthier landowners and the old nobles, as well as high Anglican clergy. The Roundheads, borrowing ideas from Gustavus Adolphus of Sweden, formed what was known as the New Model Army and effectively defeated the Royalists by 1645 at the Battle of Naseby. After this defeat, the English Commonwealth was created and a rump parliament that existed only of supporters of the Roundheads was created. And this rump parliament ordered the execution of Charles I. And with that said, Oliver Cromwell came to power in England. At first, Cromwell tried to rule with parliament. However, by 1652 or 53, he dismissed parliament and ruled as Lord Protector. And although on paper, England was a Commonwealth Republic, it really was a military dictatorship during this time. Please note that some of the English-Irish problems increased during this time period. Cromwell was particularly brutal to the Irish Catholics and sent more and more English, or granted more and more English Protestant landowners land in Ireland, leading to a permanent working class of Irish landless peasants, which will increase friction between the two areas. By 1658 or 59, Cromwell dies. His son becomes a Lord Protector. His son was unable to really rule. And by 1660, the Stuarts are restored, a concept we'll talk about later in our review. 
this year. Furthermore, monarchs seeking increased power often face challenges from nobles um, who want to retain traditional forms of governance. And this is best evident in Cardinal Richelieu's France. After the French Wars of Religion, Henry of Navarre became the new French king and converted to Catholicism. However, one of his first and earliest laws was the Edict of Nantes, which gave religious tolerance to the Huguenots who had been fighting the Catholics during the wars. This also allowed Huguenots, who were often members of the nobility and bourgeoisie, to control their own lands as well as practice their religion freely. But regarding the state, they were often allowed to keep their own armies. When Richelieu became regent for Louis XIII, he wanted to end Huguenot influence, not because of their religion, but because of their armies. And so Huguenots were still free to practice, but he forced them to disband their private armies in order to strengthen the state. Uh, furthermore, as spoke, talked about earlier, Richelieu went to war against the Catholic Habsburgs and began to build up France and to build it into a more powerful state. But there was great resentment from the nobles about the loss of their own power. Richelieu also created something known as the intendant system, and this intendant system further enhanced the power of the monarchy. Intendants were often members of the middle class who had no claim to the throne or to nobility, and they were often known as the ears and eyes of the king and went about, went throughout France enforcing the laws of the king. After the death of Louis XIII and Richelieu, Louis XIV became king, and he was only four or five years old at that time. The regent Cardinal Mazarin ruled in his place. And by the time Louis was nine, an aristocratic revolt called the Fronde broke out in the city of Paris. As a young boy, Louis was forced to go into hiding. And ultimately during the Fronde, nobles started fighting each other. The urban masses of Paris got involved in the fighting. And by 1652, the Fronde ended without a victory for the nobles, but instead the nobles agreed to Louis's rule as king or Mazarin's rule as regent for Louis, a concept we'll discuss at a later date. Eastern Europe during this time period did not develop in the same way as Western Europe. Although we'll begin to, especially in Muscovy, later known as Russia, and the Ottoman Empire. Poland and Lithuania had a very strong nobility which elected their king. Thus, as the nobles continued to gain power, the sovereignty of the king was decreased. Lithuania was ultimately taken over by the Russians, and by the 18th century, Poland will cease to exist after the three partitions against it. The Ottoman Empire was the dominant power in southeastern Europe, and after the conquering of the Byzantine Empire in 1453, continued its expansion into Central Europe as well. Halted by the Austrians after the siege of Vienna in the late 17th century, the Ottoman Empire will continue to play a substantial role in Eastern European politics until the end of World War I. Finally, the growth of Muscovy, or Russia, began when Ivan III, the Grand Duke of Muscovy, expelled the Mongols from that area. He began to build up a stronger centralized state and combined his authority with the religious authority of the Orthodox Church. Thus, Moscow became known as the Third Rome and Ivan became known as the Tsar or Caesar of Muscovy. Ivan IV continued his policies. However, after the death of Ivan IV or Ivan the Terrible, Russia went into a time of troubles until the formation of the Romanov dynasty in the 17th century. That is all for Key Concept 1-2. Our next review will be on Key Concept 1-3.